In 2021, our employees asked about 27,000 questions from the chatbot and completed about 16,000 transactions. So this year, our focus is really um, reinforcing awareness and adoption while we're working to continue to improve our processes, our content, our support structure. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, welcome to We Are Only Human. I'm really glad that you're here with us today. And I'm going to tell you, one of the things that gets me when it comes to talking about employee experience is I have this issue because it can feel very vague and undefined. People talk about it like it's this thing and it's actually a whole big host of things. And so it is my goal with a podcast to make sure that we take these things that are, can be just buzzwords and platitudes and generalities and make them real, make them tangible and practical for you. So today I'm going to do my very best to do that and draw those things out from our amazing guests. And um, I have the distinct pleasure of talking with Nicole Sloan, Kimberly Clark, and Melissa Swisher from Socrates about Kimberly Clark's journey of transformation. So Nicole has promised me some great insights and things. and I'm thrilled to have both of them here with us. And so to get started, Nicole, would you take a second and give us a little bit more about who you are and what you do, please? Sure. And so I'm excited, excited to be here, Ben. I've been with Kimberly Clark for a long time in a variety of roles within HR. Most recently, I spent a couple of years dedicated to our HR transformation, implementing tools to enhance our digital experience. Mm-hmm. And now I'm le- leading employee experience. Excellent. Wonderful. I'm glad you're here. So, um, Melissa. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben, and great to be here today. Um, Melissa Swisher, I'm the Chief Revenue Officer and Co-Founder of Socrates and have been in this employee experience journey for the last five years, trying to help companies just maximize that opportunity. Wonderful. And we're going to get some good insights on maximizing that for sure today. I'm excited to talk about the digital side of this, Nicole, because I've been saying for the last couple of years, especially, that for a lot of companies that are trying to figure out what they're doing, for many of them, the employee experience needs to be digital first as they're thinking about this. So I'd love for you to lead in with this. It's a, asking you to boil down the work of your the work of your hands for the last couple of years is probably difficult to do, but I'd love to get a, if you take a shot at that and tell us about this experience journey as it's morphed and evolved at Kimberly Clark and what's that look like? Okay. First, I'll give you just a a little bit of background that we have over 46,000 employees globally, and this year uh, marks our 150th anniversary. So we've been around for a while. Historically, employee experience has varied based on location, and our support model was decentralized. So the variation made it difficult for us to understand our current state. So as part of our transformation efforts, we were taking the opportunity to simplify and standardize the employee experience through the global HR technology foundation that we were building. So we started building that in 2020. I'll give you a walkthrough. We started in 2020 and we implemented an employee experience platform. We use ServiceNow, but we use that to enable our global HR service delivery, connecting our systems, processes, information, services, people, kind of everything in a one-stop shop. We implemented a portal for HR knowledge base, At the time, we migrated about 2,500 articles, we enabled 18 languages, and we had a back-end case management system with that. Toward the end of 2020, then, we went live with our Casey chatbot, and so working with Melissa and her team at Socrates to introduce that. Chat was completely new for HR. So we chose that be- the the Casey chatbot because it was system agnostic. It kind of sit anywhere, handles questions and actions that employees might be taking. It was cross-functional. So I think what's really important that we did was we partnered with IT. So we went live together to answer employee questions for IT and HR. And then we went live small with content in two languages and, and about 13 languages. But in 2021, that was all about expanding our capability. More broadly, we were implementing global HR shared services 
So that was a huge undertaking. We did country by country. We expanded the capability of our Casey chatbot. So we built up to 5,000 articles that were accessible uh, to answer questions. We had about 150 transactions and all 18 languages. And in 2021, our employees asked about 27,000 questions from the chatbot and completed about 16,000 transactions. So this year, our focus is really um, reinforcing awareness and adoption while we're working to continue to improve our processes, our content, our support structure. So one of the things we're doing is we're reviewing what's called a taxonomy, which is a weird word, but it, it really is just the structure and the categories of our case management and our content and making sure that's aligned across. Because I think the having your taxonomies aligned across like the portal and the chat and the case management is, is key. And then also the right kind of routing for your cases going to the support team, the right support teams. And we're also introducing live chat support. So the support team will be able to connect with employees through live chat as well this year. So you're, you've driven them into chat to get them used to answering, getting questions answered and getting some service support that way. And now you're going to say, Hey, in addition to all the other stuff that you could already get, now you're going to get, you can get somebody if you need to. And I was going to make, make a comment there for the audience out there. For those of you listening in, when she said the chatbot's name is KC, K-A-Y-C-E is how they've spelled that, like a person's name, but KC for Kimberly Clark. So there's the, the fun kind of uh, tie-in there to who they are. I always have fun seeing how people name name theirs because sometimes it's something very bland, but other times they, they find some way to connect it back to who they are and what they're about. So that's always fun to, to see that part of it. So I'd love to hear, Melissa, we heard all these really intriguing and amazing things, honestly, that um, Nicole and the team are working on. Where does Socrates fit into this as a partner and help to support that? Nicole and the team at Casey have been phenomenal partners. And I think that's really where it started. This willingness in terms of looking at this from a holistic point of view, as Nicole mentioned, it's not just about HR help or IT help. They've really come together to really support the employees from that perspective. So I think first and foremost, that's a lot of kudos to them about the way they thought about it. And I think what we've tried to do for them as a partner has really been around taking their desire and goal to really meeting employees where they are and giving them this consistent holistic experience. This is a pretty big undertaking if you think about the ecosystem and infrastructure that might that exists within Casey or any big global company. And you think about all the pieces that have to come together. And so I think from their point of view, it was really about, as Nicole mentioned, this foundational approach and working with them to say, how do we get to a really great base ground? But then also let's start to really look at and attack, tackle and address the things that we know have high impact. Casey has a really diverse workforce population. And so I think that's also super important is the ability to think about it from how are we going to serve the different aspects of their organization, whether it's globally or a mill worker or an office worker. And the ability to tie it all together and being on the forefront of thinking about consumer experiences because they're such a great consumer company, but being able to do that from a point of view of giving that and offering that back to their employees is really the places of where we work a lot with the team to, to, try to, to try to help get them there, which they've been great partners to. Wonderful. There's one of the things that you touched on, Nicole, earlier that I, that I wanted to ask a question about, if you don't mind, because you mentioned taxonomy, and I know that's one thing that's... For you, it's, you tried to give a little bit of a clarification on that, but for the audience out there that hasn't gone down this path, what is the importance of a taxonomy in the bigger picture of this thing you're trying to do? Because I think that's, just give them a little bit of a, if you don't mind, a little bit of understanding about that and what it is, because I've talked to, I talked to a leader this week, actually, and they tried to roll out their own kind of employee self-service and get your answers here. And they don't have the right things in place. And so they're not getting that support. They can't get to the right router to the right answers and things like that. So talk about taxonomy as that foundation piece, if you don't mind, because I think that's going to help all, all this become more clear to the people out there that are the average HR leaders may not have had that experience you've had. Sure. So as I said, we're taking another look at that and making some adjustments, but there's a front end impact and there's a back end impact. So the front end impact is for the employee to be able to categorize their question or what is it that you're looking for? What are you trying to request? So if you can break it down into the right categories and subcategories, 
they're going to find it faster. And, and that's really what you want. You want them to find what they need, get there, take care of it and get back to work. I and mean, they don't want to be frustrated and have some kind of, you know, barrier that didn't allow them or they got frustrated in the process. The front end impact is important, right? So that employees can get there and, and identify and categorize their question. What happens on the back end and what you want to tie into that is having your content categorized in a way that you can tie that into the types of questions they're asking. Then you've got the back end support team and the support team is also probably tapping into that same content, right? So they're using it. If the employee had trouble or didn't look or whatever the case would, would it be, then the support team is also using that same content. Then ultimately you want to be able to report on it. So if you've tied everything together in the right way, you're going to get the insights out of your reporting and analytics side. If you didn't build it right, you're going to struggle with that and you didn't quite get to what you were needing and you'll have to second crack at it or figure out where did the breakdown happen. So if you can build it and align it, it's going to help the employee and it's going to help you in your reporting. Excellent. I didn't even think about the reporting piece. I'm glad you mentioned that one because Obviously, when we start doing something like this, someone at some point, someone's going to say, hey, how's that going? How's that working? And you want to be able to answer them with some degree of specificity, not to say that, hey, we had this many thousands of conversations or anything else. I think that's important. But to be able to go a layer deeper and say, you know what, maybe we're not clear enough in the way we explain our benefits because 92% of the questions were about their benefits or something like that. So giving you some idea of what to do exactly. next or where to, where to apply some of your knowledge to hopefully preempt some of those questions in, in the future. And it's critical to continuous improvement. Yes, for sure. Excellent. Okay. I want to ask like a few other questions. I'm having fun with this. So when it comes to this big transformation, you started down this path and what problems were you trying to solve fundamentally when you, when the, the organization decided, okay, this is the next thing. This is our next priority. We're going to start marching down this, as you've already pointed out, this is a, this isn't a six month and we're done. It's a multi-year journey as you're trying to continually hone this and get it better. What problems are you trying to solve when you began this? So I think one of the examples we let, we use sometimes is banking. And that may or may not resonate with people. When you think about how banking used to be done and you'd walk into a physical building, you'd talk to someone and, and you'd take care of your banking. And now look at what we're doing individually. We can transfer funds through an app and the way we take care of banking types of things and how electronically, digitally we, we can handle those kind of things. And when you think about employees doing that in their personal lives and then coming to work, and still having to go walk in the building, go find a human and ask a question or get something done. It's just not, that's not their experience at home. So it's really trying to match that to some extent. We know we can't do that perfectly, but meeting the employee expectation of a consumer-like experience. So that was really one of them. Another one is similar, but 24 seven support accessibility. When we think about our employee population, we have them working different shifts, different hours. You have people who have a desk, you have people who are deskless and in a frontline manufacturing type of role. So how do you make it accessible? And then I think finally, just the simplification and standardization of self-service to have a consistent experience globally which we knew we didn't have when we started this. Yeah, I heard earlier, I, I picked up on it when you said it wasn't just about um, having a consistent experience, but trying to simplify that too, because in some cases it's probably 15 hoops to jump through. And how do we, where do I go for that question to submit that? How do I get routed down this path for a question around benefits, like I said earlier, or versus an, an IT ticket? And again, there's so much complexity and we sometimes take it for granted, I know, as leaders, because we're in the mix, we're in the mix of how those decisions get made. And we know the other stakeholders really well, but for the app, Again, for the average employee, someone who's working on a, on a line or something else, that can become really confusing because that's not their job to know those things. It's their job to, to do whatever the task is in front of them. So really trying to make, put that in their hands and make that as simple as possible so they can, as you said earlier, get the information they need and get back to work is, is important there. So um, Melissa, one of the things that we know about transformation is this can't be just about the technology. It can't be just about the people. Um, they can't just be about the culture. They're all fitting together in this. And I'd love to hear from you how you and the human Socrates are helping to enable those three aspects of this when it comes to, obviously the technology side is easy, um, but how are you enabling the other pieces of this, like the people on the culture side of this big transformation? Because I have to imagine there's some element to that beyond just 
putting a chat bot in someone's hands that probably fits into this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think Nicole had a lot of great points and kind of would just echo that as we start talking about it. I love the analogy of a banking, but I was, I've been saying lately about when's the last time you called 411? Some of my teammates are like, what is 411? And I was like, ah, but besides that, in terms of the way that people consume data, and I think that has to really be the thing that shines through when you talk about culture and that experience that you're offering your workforce, it has to be a consumer like experience and simple. Right. The technology is one thing and has the ability to tie all these pieces together, right? Whether where systems live, where the documentation lives, all that and make it a consistent, simplified experience from the user end. But the technology, the culture and people is really important. And so when we thought about this, it's really a couple of key elements. What were the high impact areas that we could think about that could help get people to what they needed? And oftentimes that comes in the form of personalization. So part of the journey, I think that we've seen with KC and and Nicole can certainly echo this is that as time's gone by, what we see more people doing is the more comfortable they get around questions, the more they think about personalization. So what's specific to me as the end user? And so I think of those things as actions or to do's, right? And it's how do I request time off or I need to take time off. So why can't I just go ahead and do something in a way that's very conversational right? Or updating personal information versus having to go into multiple systems. That whole convenience factor of meeting people where they are was also critical. KC was brilliant in the fact that they've focused on the KC experience on their two ServiceNow environments, their Microsoft Teams solution, and most recently with the procurement hub. So from a holistic and meeting people where they are, I think is key from a culture. But then the second part related to that is then what are the things impacting them? You're over year, right? So if we think about the things that happen in every given year, there's things that happen seasonal. So we're just finishing up right now year end. Everybody's asking about W2s. We're gonna go into performance review planning and then open enrollment. And then how do we also start to look at this from ensuring we're gonna have maximum, maximizing all the great benefits and solutions KC offers and making sure people know where to go in order to get that or to be able to do something directly from that, I think has, huge impact. And, and that's why it's not just a one and done journey to absolutely to your point. You know, I hadn't thought about it until you were saying some of those things, Melissa, but I think about some of our own personal experiences to the banking point that Nicole, you made earlier. We just recently finally broke down and got a Google assistant enabled device here. And at first it was, Hey, just play music, right? That's what the kids use it for all the time or set a timer for this or in the kitchen. But now it's, Hey, add this to the grocery list or remind me to do this thing later on because I'll probably forget. And to your point, what we start doing, doing these things that we expect. And then over time, we're like, I wonder if I can also do this and also do that. And can I add this other thing in? And so there's some really fun things around that. And that actually echoes some of the research we did last year around when companies start using bots and other automation, things like that, they then use that freed up time to focus more on things like business impact and on building better stakeholder relationships. And it's because you have that time freed up, you're not just answering questions, right, from your employees all the time. You have a chance to do some of those other things that are important to you, but are hard to get to sometimes because we're spending all of that just investing back into them. And so by, by changing this up a little bit, that gives us more of a focus there. So that's really interesting. So let's take this further. So this journey has been going on. There's been some really important aspects of personalization and really trying to make sure people feel like they have an opportunity to get their problems solved, the questions answered, whatever they're bringing to bringing to Casey and is the case. Nicole, when it comes to measuring success here, do you have some metrics that you started out with or some things that you said, hey, we, we'd like to hit this or even anecdotally, it doesn't matter to me. I just love to hear from you how you're trying to figure out if this is working. You gave us some really good numbers earlier on, on volume and usage. And I think those, if there was nothing else, I think that would be very telling to say, these people had questions, they got answers, and we got to spend our time somewhere else that was important. And those people were heard and listened to and, and felt supported. But are there other things you're also thinking about in this that you're trying to figure out? Yeah. So when we first started, we we did the project charter and we had some targets and we were thinking about this. And we started with that, the portal and the chatbot usage for different parts of the employee population. We just want to measure, okay, are, are these employees using it? Are, are these over here using it? Maybe having ratings on our content to get feedback and employees, are they opening their own cases for questions or is someone doing it for them? 
things like that. We're actually, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we were establishing our global shared services model throughout last year, all the way to the end of the year. So this year is really the first year we could really establish a baseline. And so initially we are measuring usage and types of support that employees need or value. We expect initially that case management would increase, like we'd have more cases, more questions coming in as there's adoption. But eventually then as we mature, we would look to deflect some of that with this the chatbot and some of this self-service, other avenues they can find answers, right? And, and we know right now that we need higher adoption of the chatbot. So those are, we have some initial data, but we're really establish, establishing that baseline that's helping us draw some insights so we know like where do we go next and where do we need to help with the engagement. But we're moving toward trying to tie together data between portal search, case management, chatbot activity, to identify opportunities. So those are kind of separate data sets when you think about it. So I, I don't think we had the full visibility going into this. So I'd say one of the learnings is that we had to get things up and running before we knew the best tool and the best way to pull insights from multiple data sets and dashboards. And so this is the work in progress right now because we didn't really have that full visibility. So it's something you have to establish once you get there to some extent, you might know what you're trying to measure, but then it's the how, right? Yes, for sure. Well, I was curious, you had mentioned that earlier and I could, I just drove right by it, but you had this major, this other major transformation essentially going to HR global shared services. In addition to this other big rollout, do you think it was harder or easier to have those two things coming together? Because it, you were thinking about both of them at the same time, trying to figure out, does this feed that one? Does this one feed that one? Was it harder to do those two things at the same time? Or would have been easier to stage that out if you, you know, had your magic wand and could fix all those things or do it over? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's the, which came first, the chicken or the egg yes. and which do you, you know, uh, I, I don't know. We could have done it in the reverse and maybe mm -hmm. that would have, you know, felt different. The fact of the matter is this is how we had to go about it. So it might've been a little easier. I do think this, it is a progression regardless, right? So we had to establish the technology piece. We had to establish how our delivery model was going to work getting them connected in with each other. And I think one, one thing I wanted to go back to that you said earlier, you were talking about, I don't want to overemphasize the technology piece at, in the way that we're trying to take the humans out of it. it, it I, I really look at it as we're not taking the humans out of it. We're taking the robot out of the human, right? It, when you have a chat bot, it's like you try to put the things in the right place where they belong. So things that you're comfortable doing through chat, you can do it. And then where you need a human, we still want the human there. So that was really the shared services part of it is we do have the support team there if people want to engage and, and they need the help and then they're there. So ultimately it's all coming together, but yeah, it, it's quite a journey. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of the big hurdles. I talked to some leaders that are, yeah, we want to do that, but What's it going to feel like to be on the other end of that? What's it going to be, feel like to be an employee and have to do this in that sort of regard? And if it's something as simple as what's my deductible or whatever else, that doesn't require a human. But if it's a, hey, if we have this emergency and I really need somebody to help me, you have the right person there ready to jump in and support them. And I think that's what people want to know. They want to know that in their moment of need, is someone really going to be there? And you've already established that's that was critical for y'all as y'all were developing this and putting it together. Excellent. And I think it's a key part of our culture too. Every company is different, right? So we know we're not going to have a hundred percent of you have to go through this chatting with a bot for a hundred percent of your support. We, we're not going to go there because it's just, that's not our culture. Well, there's, yeah. I'll tell you really quickly. There's a, one of the stats that I put in the book that was so amazing to me because it surprised me is I was a little skeptical when the whole conversation around bot started years ago. I was a little skeptical about that. Like what it would feel like. And so I was talking to a company and they said, you know what, this is our, the thing that matters to us. When people are going through and talking to the bot at the end of that transaction, they've got their task handled, their, their question answered, 75% of them say, thank you. Knowing full well that it's not a human, they say, thank you. Most of the time when we go to, even in our consumer world, that we think that's the pinnacle of things. So sometimes we want to just pull our hair out because the experience is not good. And so saying 
we are taking care of people so well that they're saying thank you, even though they know it's not a person at the other end. That's really important. It's hard to measure that feeling, what that feels like to them. But if they're good enough to say, hey, I'm, I'm, that's, a, that's almost a feedback loop of mission accomplished there. So there's some good, there's definitely some good pieces to that, maybe hard to measure, at least initially. Um, Melissa, I'm going to throw a question at yeah. you. Don't mind. I was just going to, if you don't mind, just to add on that, I think if you think about that from an employee lens, they have a strategic need. And that is really where that conversation from HR comes in. How can you help me in that moment? There's the pieces that are tactical that I think are, how do we drive efficiency into some of the process and make it super easy and automated? And the last piece is super, super important to me, which is that emotional aspect, which is what Kate, you know, you just t- touched on with the thank you and, and Nicole and the team is so thoughtful of at KC about right? How do you emotionally make sure you're connecting with it? And you can do it with both avenues, right? Technology can warm your heart with some multimedia or memes and gifs or gifs, however you want to pronounce it. And, but then the importance of that relationship and dynamic between HR is super, super important too. So just didn't want to forget about that. So. I'm, again, I'm a big proponent of these tools and the biggest op- obstacle to overcome a lot of times is, does it feel human? Is this just keep people at arm's length or is it so that we can serve them in those things that are most important and have those other things that they don't, they honestly don't care if it's a bot, as long as it gets the question answered, that's all that matters to them. And that's what we see in our research is candidates, employees, they're not really picky if it's something simple like that, but more strategic to your, to use the word that you use there. That's the time they really want, or if it's high emotion, or if there's other some other circumstance that's very unique and beyond whatever the, the template answer can get them. So I love that. One other thing I'll throw in here, if you don't, we're just gonna keep, I'm going to stay on this topic forever, it feels like. the we're, This is a chat bot. It uses AI, all the other fun stuff there, but that is not making up new answers to the questions people are asking. The team at KC has said, these are the answers. That, this is how we communicate to people. This is how we show them their value and appreciate it. This is how we answer their questions. And the bot just, the AI just helps to find the right answer that's already been chosen by a human. So it's not about having that just generate something, some random response to a question based on whatever it thinks is the right thing. It's actually saying, no, no, no. Nicole or someone on Nicole's team has already said, this is how we respond to this. This is our way that we believe in. And that's how we're going to get that back to you. So again, to, just to double click on that whole human piece of this, that's where it really comes out. And that's where the advice I give companies when they're worried about what does this feel like? That's one other piece of advice I give. So, okay. I think I've spent all the piece of advice I have there. Let's go into your advice, Nicole, if you don't mind for the leaders listening in right now, I'm sure all of them have taken some really good notes in this conversation, but I'd love to give you a chance to give them some clear takeaways or advice based on your own experiences, these lessons learned, or, hey, this is the, the thing you have to do if you want to make it successful. It doesn't matter what it is. I just love to hear from you what those might be. And Melissa, if you're interested in throwing one or two in there as well, I respect your, your opinion and your advice as well. Nicole, what you got for us? I think what I would say first is involve employees. This is for them, right? So when we, it's a huge miss if you're going through and you're talking to HR about how do we deliver and and you're really then only serving the need of HR, right? So involve employees in design, involve them in testing. What HR thinks we need to deliver has to be validated and you really have to involve employees. And it sounds simple, but we miss that sometimes. And I think that's a key one. Another one I would say is create cross-functional partnerships and governance. So when we partnered with IT, that it sounds a little difficult because it's like, okay, now we got to do this together and we got to align on things, but it's not always easy to do, but when you do it, you'll be glad you did. So I think the cross-functional partnerships is important. And then I would also say, don't be overwhelmed. Employee experience is huge. It can involve so many aspects, but prioritize, do what you can do and and then move on to the next thing. And so I've talked to other leaders and it's, it is, it's overwhelming to them. And they're, and I've heard the same thing from them. Just choose what you can do first and do the first thing first, and then go to the next thing. Excellent. Eat, the, eat that elephant one bite at a time. Wonderful. Okay. Melissa, anything to add to those? Yeah, I definitely would echo Nicole's sentiment on the engaging with your employees and talking to different groups. Surveys can be dangerous a little bit because it's a point in time reaction, right? If you're having a bad day, somebody might respond differently. But if you think about engaging user groups and so many big companies have these wonderful user advisory groups, inclusive of um, KC, 
but to be really understanding because they don't think like HR domain experts. They talk in terms of in, in the way that they engage with things is very different. But I also would probably add to just two, two quick things, which is this gives people an opportunity to not replicate what I'd call bad process or system configuration. That takes that out of it from a sense of making a much more conversational experience just because something's configured one way in a software application. You have the opportunity to make it much more human and engaging and get them the way that, that they might want to interact with technology in a way they haven't been able to before. So I think that's really a great opportunity to think about it. And it's not all a one and done. It's in Nicole's point, it's a journey. And I think that the way that this technology has to be rolled out is very thoughtful of that journey over time versus a traditional, hey, we do this implementation, we go live and we're done. It's evolutionary and it should be through the life of a partnership. So I love that. Oh, goodness. I've, I've got my own notes over here. I've been taking us. We've been going through, by the way. So many good takeaways and ideas and everything else. I've enjoyed this so much. I appreciate both of you for, for being here. If someone wants to connect with you or follow you, I don't know if you're up for that, but if there's a way to, to do it best, I'd love for you to share it here. Absolutely. So I, I'm happy to connect on LinkedIn. I'm always looking for people who are interested in the employee experience space or are wanting to share. So just look for me on LinkedIn, Nicole Sloan. I'll get your link in the show notes there. Melissa, how about you? Yeah, happy to talk and love this topic. So it's super passionate for me. So look me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter. My handle is mswish528. So would love to just chat further. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you again to both of you. This was so much fun. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And to all of you out there, I hope you got some really good takeaways from today's episode, today's conversation. Goodness. I, again, I want to go through all my, my list of takeaways. Like it's too long to do that, but start small, expand from there. This is evolutionary. This isn't a one step, one and done kind of thing. And at the core of all of this, you heard over and over in the conversation today, put your people at the center of it. They're not, they're not, outside of this bubble. They are the reason we're doing these kinds of things so we can serve them and take care of them better. Thank you all for joining us. We're Only Human, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.